Hey everyone, if there is one thing that no one does, but I mean no one, that's leaving their keys outside their door, unless they are living in a country, still, you don't want to do that. And it goes the same way for their websites. You want to protect it. Maybe you don't know Symfony Secrets component or how it works when well, you're in the right place. But should you trust Symfony Secrets? I mean, if you open the Symfony blog, what do you see? This is based on a traditional public key cryptography and Lipsodium. Traditional? Not testing your code is traditional. But we are here to discover if this is really something worth it to trust. If you open your console, Vault is a set of commands that will help you to generate keys and code and decode your data. The first command that you might want to run is bin console secrets generate keys. If you open your directory config secrets dev, you will find two files, public file and a private file. These two files are your keys. You will have to create these keys for every environment you manage. Production, staging, development, even local. Why are we even doing this? Let me explain. Encryption transforms your data into a string, a series of string of a non-fixed length. There are two main types of encryption, symmetric encryption and asymmetric encryption. The symmetric encryption uses the same key to encrypt and decrypt. Whether in the asymmetric key or public key encryption, it uses two keys, one to encrypt, one to decrypt. Now, technically, it doesn't matter which one you choose, as for public or private key. Both can be used to encrypt and decrypt. But as soon as you choose one to encrypt, only this other one can decrypt your data. This is a basic manipulation of a public key cryptography system. Choosing a key to encrypt your data makes it public, which means that everyone should be able to use it to encrypt further new data. This one can be versioned into your Git. As for the second one, the one that you will use to decrypt, this one should be kept private. It cannot be versioned into your Git. Only the intended receptor can be accountable for that. Only he could have that key in its end. By he, I mean the server, of course. A technique one could use, but does not really apply to our situation, is the technique of the double encryption. Let's say I send you a message. I take your public key and I use it to encrypt the data. Only you can decrypt it. Great. But I told you, either the two keys can encrypt your data. What if I start before with encrypting the message with my private key? Only the public key can decrypt it. And just after that, I encrypt it with your public key. Therefore, only you can decrypt it in the first place. Then, well, everyone can decrypt it in the second place because my key is public. Therefore, this key, only you could decrypt it and only I could have wrote it. Now, the fun part. How these two keys are generated? Well, we need to select two prime numbers. Let's name them P and Q. This is part of every cryptography assumption. This assumption is that no computer from now is able to crack the product of these two files. No one is able to find the two original values of these two large prime numbers multiplied together. And every cryptography system is based on that assumption. Their product will be a really large number, a huge number. We are going to name it N. And this number could be public. It does not matter. The next step before the public key, is to calculate the totient, which is the number of elements in N that can be only divided by one or themselves. Thanks to that, we are going to calculate the public key. 
The public key is the value that is situated be between 3 and touchant of n that has no common divider with touchant of n. To calculate the private key, we need to use a function, the extended Euclid algorithm. We are going to find a value that is the inverse multiplier. What does that mean? That means that to prove that my value is a proper private key, I need to find that my private key multiplied by my public key answer to one question. If that value is made into a modulo totient of n, I should have as an answer 1. If not, it's not a proper private key. Now, we have our public key and private key. Can you enter bin console secrets set and pwd for password? It will ask for you to type in your password and it will store it into a new file. If you open that file, you will see that this is just garbage. You can't use it as per se. If you want to display it in your console, you can use secrets list or even secret list minus minus reveal. With that, you can display your values encoded or decoded. To use this value in Symfony, you can define them as parameter as you would do for an environment variable. You just have to prefix them with secrets. Now, I'm pretty sure you are wondering how it works. But the real problem is not really the keys, right? It's more how it works inside. Because all of, all of this doesn't tell me if Flipsodium is good. If Flipsodium is trustworthy. Well, yes, because it uses a famous well-known elliptic curve, X25519. It uses uh, X salsa 20 or uh, poly 1309. But before detailing all this works, uh, I should contextualize this uh, a little. Uh, I need to contextualize their existence. And to do this, we need to understand what's a stake. To hash a string, everyone knows SHA-1. This is for secure hashing algorithm, which is funny because it's not so secure anymore. Researchers started to show some flaws into the algorithm around 2005, but nothing to worry because it was really expensive. I mean, the technology of the time, it was the equivalent of 2.7 billion euros to inject. So really, it was like a theoretical attack. Still, it was possible. Now, in 2015, the graphic cards evolved a lot and it became possible. Uh, a well-established criminal or state could start thinking about cracking SHA-1 with a, a cluster of 64 uh, graphic cards, for instance. It was estimated around 120,000 euros to crack some kind of SHA-1 value. Still, it, it took some time, but it was possible. In 2017, it even worse, and in 2019, well, it's over. There is a, a particular technique that makes a KO on SHA-1. Uh, so you should turn to, to SHA-2 for a minimum of reliability. But we should stay uh, careful with our work because we are talking about cryptography. Um, in cryptography, saying that a hash has been cracked, or that an algorithm has been cracked, doesn't mean that anyone is able to crack it in one click and by far. But it says that, in theory, it's proven that this hash is not reliable anymore, not 100%, but in cryptography we aim for the 100%. To understand the technique, you should know how SHA works first. This is an algorithm that transforms any string 
into a 160-bit string. And to operate, char requires an input of 512-bit string. And it uses a compression algorithm that will take groups of bits to make a single one. If it's longer than 512, then it will be cut in blocks of 512. And if a block is shorter, then it will be um, extended. We have to add a positive bit at the end of the message, then a bunch of zeros, and then the value, which is the length of the message. So for instance, one zero, zero, one, one, zero, add a one, then a bunch of zero, and then one, one, one. The compression function will perform bit shift from a matrix defined in the implementation. This algorithm will execute this compression function like 80 times to obtain, in the end, a 160-bit string. For those with an eye, you can see that the string produced at the screen right now is a 20-byte binary, which is written as a 40-byte hexadecimal string. This is because I've used PHP and it goes the same with JavaScript. The method returns it doubled. In SHA-1, the, current, the correspondence matrix is defined, and it means that we will always find the same result for the same string. There is a small possibility that different inputs can produce the same hash. And the technique that is used for the attack reduces the number of variations to be tested to achieve this. This technique is the paradox of the babies, or uh, birthday paradox or birthday near collision attack. With this approach, you go much, much faster than before. Let me explain the principle to you. Among 23 babies born in the world, what is the probability of these babies having the same date of birth? 23 over 365, which makes 6% of chance. Wrong. It's not that at all. It's 50%. And if you push it up to 50 babies, you end up with a 97% of chance. If you go up with 75 babies, you end up with a 99.97% of chance. It's a paradox. It seems absurd. But we have the math to prove it. How is it possible that such a small group have such a high chance of having the same birthday. How can we prove that among these 365 possibilities, just a thick is enough to have a collision? In fact, we are going to prove the opposite. We are going to prove that they don't have the same birthday, and it's easier. Baby one is born, so he has all the choices in the world, 365 over 365. Now baby two is born, the probability of that it does not have the same birthday is 365 by 365 multiplied by 364 over 365. One day less than the number of babies already born. Baby 3 is born, so it has 265 over 365 multiplied by 364 over 365 multiplied by 363 uh, over 365 and so on for the fourth baby. This calculation has a simpler expression, which is the factorial of 364 divided by factorial of 365 minus the number of baby multiplied by 365 of power number of baby, babies number minus 1. For 23 babies, we are waiting for the result of 364 factorial divided by 342 uh, factorial multiplied by 365 by power of 22 which uh, gives us 0.49 and so on. So almost 50% of chance that still the babies does not have the same date of birth. The trick is we evaluate the probability of each babies among themselves. We don't check that one of the babies between 2 and 23 has the same birthday as baby 1 among the 365 possibilities, but rather that two of the 23 babies have the same birthday among the 365 possibilities. This is surprising, but the math proves it. And every very logically, the more babies you add up, 
the more the greater the risk of interpolation um, augment. To break Sha1, the researchers use that technique to try to cause a collision. Let's assume that I have a file in my possession that will produce this hash. My goal as a researcher is to create a new file that creates the same hash. I will try to add up a multitude of characters, spaces, comma, apostrophes, new line, anything I want. And I will try to get the, uh, the same hash in the end with this variation. The principle before helps me to reduce the number of variation. Thanks to that, MD5 and SHA1 are broken. And I can pass one document as another. To understand how reduced is the difficulty to compute a collision, let's put that into context. SHA1 produces a, a result of 160 bits with a collision probability of 1 over 280, which is about 12 million years of GPU computing. Even the, the NSA or the NASA wouldn't try it. With the above method, this probability is lower to 2 to power 60, which becomes possible with a few graphic cards. It's insanely lower. As for now, there is every reason to, every reason to switch to SHA2, uh, since it's from 160 to 256 or even 512 bits, uh, which gives us a probability of 2 of power 128, which is considerably higher. But the fact that it remains possible is a risk. So we need to imagine other ways to secure our data and making the result of even more random. In modern algorithms, they use these SP networks. It's for SP for substitution permutation. Enigma, the machine, does substitution. It has a substitution level of one to one. With, with each gear rotation in the machine, one letter equal another letter. This means that if I want to decode a secret, I need to focus on the pair. Once I've got one letter, then the other, I can remove that pair from the equation and focus on the rest. When you use MD4, MD5, J0 and J1, it uses the same principle, but it will add some mathematical operation to it, XOR, OR, NOT, uh, AND, modulo, stuff like that. But nevertheless, um, this method is still possible to be to create different files uh, with the same signature, which is not perfect. So we need to add more confusion. We're going to use permutation. Instead of replacing the values, we're going to mix their position. And be careful as the first step is not random. They are predefined values. And it's necessary to be able to come back to the original status, the original position. The way it works, the first time the string will be encoded in blocks of a certain size. And if the last block or the only block is smaller, then we extend it. Each block is passed um, into an S-box, a substitution box. And its purpose is to exchange their value by another from a predefined matrix. The block of value that are put together again, then it's it already been less. And the value is submitted within a P-box, a permutation box, where we don't replace the value. We just move them into the chain. If we stop there, we do a little better, but not much better than Enigma. Then we're going to use a key, a hash, that will be split into blocks, one for each step. And we're going to mix that block with a message with an XR operation between each step. We're going to repeat these steps a certain number of times, 10 to 80 times, the number of round depends on the efficiency of one. So, bunch of substitution and permutations. AES, for instance, does it between 10 and 14. Below this, you lose in safety and 
above this, you lose in speed. For a password to secure, you prefer security, but for exchanging messages, you would like to provide some speed without lacking security. When we talk about SP network, it's impossible not to mention the one that protects almost 70% of the web, RainDAV. Following the inadequacy of its predecessors, DES and 3DES, the NIST, the National Institute for Standard and Technology, opened a competition to propose an algorithm that would be capable of surpassing its predecessor, the existing ones, and using it as the AES, which is the Advanced Encryption Standard. There were several competitors, and some were more robust, some were more slower, faster. Anyway, knowing that it was about establishing a way to communicate over the internet, it had to be fast, but not at the expense of the security. Other criteria were to include memory consumption, adaptability over time, its simplicity, stuff like that. Anyway, the winner is Rindal, Rindal, sorry, and it was created by two Belgian, uh, Vincent Ryman and Joan Damon. And in its core lives X Salsa 20, an algorithm that allows to encrypt with X fours and uh, is insensitive for time attacks. And there is a Poly 1309, which is used to check the integrity of your data. And of course, the X2255 um, 19 elliptic curve to generate the keys. The main reason I am explaining this to you is uh, that the encryption method used by Lepsodium and therefore by Symfony have an history with this algorithm. Here is how it works. It defines a matrix, a 4x4 grid, and it will cut by blocks of 16 bytes, divide a 256-bit key into pieces that will be inserted between its each X operations, and it will repeat these operations uh, between 10 to 14 times. The first step is the substitution, of course, and this is an operation that results in a value located in the Galloway field of 2 of power 8, which is to say that this is going to be located between 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 and 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. The calculation uses a lookup table to get the results. And uh, it's a set of mathematical, mathematical functions designed to ensure that an element never falls on itself by chance or that two elements does not switch their places between them. And of course that this is possible to come back at the initial state. Um, the second step is the byte shift. Uh, in our matrix, each row is shifted one row to the left, except uh, one column to the left actually, except for the first row. And this step ensures that the set of values are not encoded independently, that there is no subset of short string, and therefore that could be easier to decode. Then the last step of the round, this is a mixing of columns. Uh, this step is not performed in the last round, it does not uh, add so much variation in any way. To shuffle the data, a matrix of multiplication uh, will result again in a value located in a Galois field of 2 power 8. And for the mathematician, for the mathematician among us, um, who wonder how a multiplication of two large numbers could not go out of the imposed field, it's because the value is multiplied modulo a polynomial. And for the other, um, just imagine modulo like a clock, where instead of noon, there is the highest number allowed at noon. You can go round, 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 but never pass that. Okay, so because you can't predict the number, the key used to rotate around the clock, how many steps have been done, it's impossible to find the original value. Since we're going to repeat all the three steps it will add even more confusion for the next execution. And here too, we're going to use functions that will have the inverse. This is really important. 
So of course, all these steps are crucial. And if the implementation is not rigorous, then piece of keys could leak. But fortunately for us, it has been encoded directly in our CPU. It's almost impossible to hack and it's extremely fast. Which is why we had WannaCry. So can we entrust our secrets with Symfony and Symfony secrets? Yes. Good. Now we know the commands. We know we can put our trust into this system. Now let's see together why we should use this mechanism. Or rather, let's say when. When you deploy your applications in your web server, it's if your deployment strategy is a plain old remote synchronization of your project, your file is sent over. Usually, your project is kept into a versioning system and more and more frequently into GitLab or GitHub.com. You should never store into your versioning system the actual production credentials, right? Because you don't want to share them with the entire world. Forget the old fashioned prod parameter.yaml or the dot of dot prod dot php stored. It's really the last thing you want to do. But still, you need to share this credential in production, right? So a solution could be to use shared file and shared directories parameters. This is an option available with Capistrano, Deployer.io. Almost every deployment based on a similar approach possess this feature. But by doing this, you can create files directly into the server that won't be erased deployment after deployment. But it lack, um, it lack resilience in case the server crashes. Its poor horizontal capabilities does not make it a really good choice, especially nowadays when the cloud computing and containerization takes more and more space every day. A better solution could be to use environment variable directly available into the machine. This is one of the main reasons Symfony created the created the dot of component. Thanks to a simple percent of the name, you could use one and inject it into your project configuration. Brilliant. But if Symfony always try to pull you up and your steam and your team up into new ways, each time with a modern touch, each time better, according to the growing new technologies. They also don't want to let the others behind you that can't have a full DevOps team, that you can't, you that can't manage your own server, you that can't afford a big server, you only can afford mutualized server because not everyone has big budgets you too should be able to transmit the production configuration to your server in the open. All this without lacking security. And this is the main reason behind the uh, work of Tobias, Cherubis and Nicola. For this his and the computed secrets PHP file, you should only version the public and the secrets, never the private key. For this key, you have different approach sheets that are open to you. The first one is to upload the file or just copy its content directly on the server per se, but of course through a secure connection. And if it happens that you can add a new environment variable named Symfony Decryption Secret, you can store your key in there, encode in base64, and as the documentation mentions it, you might as well decode all your secrets locally to avoid keeping your key into your server. There is a set of commands that allow you to pass from one state to another in both ways. This is a good start, but um, if your password needs to be updated regularly, so are your keys. This is why there is the minus minus rotate options that allows you to regenerate them. So it will decode your values, generate a new set, a new pair of keys and re-encode your values again. Now, more recently, there is also a new addition that has been brought to you. Um, who among you never had a call in the middle of the afternoon saying that there is a bug in production, which is not in development, but really this is the same code. Well, 
it has to come from something related to the other services, the production services. Well, this is a situation where you possibly can't live debug in production. You probably need to switch into your testing environment to be plugged as if it were in production, but still using the staging credentials. A few weeks from now, has been introduced in Symfony 5.2 a new kernel dot runtime environment um, parameter that takes its value from the app runtime of on variable, if there is any, of course, otherwise it will fall back into the traditional kernel dot environment. Thanks to that, you are able to set your application in production mode, but using the staging credentials of the secret uh, components, it will switch from a directory to the one defined in the new parameter. And last but not least, you can tell your server in one line by tapping this command here, um, where to set your secrets, especially to avoid putting uh, any production component that obviously could not work without being into a proper production environment. Well, I think we're here. And uh, thank you for watching. If you have any questions, um, I'm here.